Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, this time we're meeting for a different course, BC 206, the Ministry of the Evangelist, Teacher and Pastor. Okay, so let's begin from where we stopped last class. Last class we stopped at chapter 5. We looked at the practical keys of doing the Ministry of the Evangelist. Now with that, we, we complete uh, the study on the ministry of the evangelist. So now we'll get into chapter six. We'll begin with the teacher and Jesus as our example. Now, I'm sure all of us have read a lot from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Synoptic Gospels, and we see that every now and then, uh, people, not only the disciples, but others also recognized Jesus as a teacher. And they would call him rabbi, which means teacher, right? And so we're going to look at the at the teacher and the and how Jesus set an example uh, when it comes to the ministry of the teacher, right? So we look at a few verses here. Uh, Matthew chapter four, verse twenty three. Matthew four twenty three. Okay, so we, I think we'll have to, all of us may have to pick up a few verses. Somebody else pick up Matthew 5, 2. Maybe someone else, Mark chapter 1, 21 and 22. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, teaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So here we see that Jesus, the temptation episode is over. He calls his disciples. The first thing he does is he went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogue. So it was not like Jesus was just, you know, passing by and he said, you know, let's heal the sick. Let's do some uh, deliverance ministry. You know, he went about teaching. Right. Okay. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 5 verse 2. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, yeah, this is powerful. Matthew chapter 5 is the Beatitudes, the great sermon on the mount. And he began to teach them, saying, look at that whole thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. And so he's teaching them. He's not just telling them who he is. You know, I'm the Messiah. I, I will do this. I will do that. No, he's teaching them principles, godly principles. He's teaching them uh, about life and about ministry. He's doing that here. Go on next. Mark 1. Mark, sorry, Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And again he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude were gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat it in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. So we see here again, he's front of the lake, and yeah. Jesus began to teach. Right uh, now, we'll also look at how he he taught. One of the ways that he taught was by using parables. Matthew four, sorry, Mark chapter four is the parable of the sower, and he begins to teach them about this parable. Okay, uh, Luke chapter five verse seventeen. Luke five seventeen. Now it happened on the certain days as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Yeah. Again, Jesus was going to heal the paralytic, but before that, he was teaching the people. Right. So we'll, we'll look at that. Now, there are many verses that we have seen. So we can establish the fact that Jesus was not just a mere miracle worker. He was not just some carpenter's son. He was a teacher. Now, if hundreds and thousands of people have to follow him, there was something about his teaching. There was something about his teaching because even the Pharisees and the Sadducees says, isn't he the carpenter's son? Where did he get all this knowledge from? How was he able to teach this way? In the book of Mark, in a few uh, verses, it says that they were, they were uh, astounded by his teaching because nobody thought with this kind of authority right and so we see jesus set the example of teaching you know could could jesus have gone and just healed people 
and you know uh, just going about healing everyone and then you know get many people to follow him could he have done it yes or no yes but he chose to teach people he knew that miracles is not the only thing because we see that sadly after his death and resurrection how many people were there 120 people there were how many people in the uh, you know five loaves of bread and two fish 5000 then again 3000 so many people everyone disowned him the book of john writes it beautifully he says many of them followed him only for the miracles but jesus knew the importance of teaching people everywhere he went he taught them now what is the nature of Jesus' teaching method. How did he teach? Did he teach random things? Did he teach great mysteries of God? Did he teach about, you know, when I was in heaven, uh, this is how I, I am? Uh, or did he teach about simple things? With How did he teach? What was his teaching method? Now, the reason we're learning this is so that we can apply it in our teaching. You know, many of us may get opportunities when you go back, you know, to either preach or to teach uh, sermons, so we can learn from this. Okay, let's look at it. There are about five methods that I've uh, put down here. Right, number one, one of the principal features of Christ's teaching method was the authority which he taught with. Matthew chapter seven, nine, Matthew seven and verse twenty nine. Let's read that. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority hmm. and not as the scribes. Look at that. For he taught them with one who had authority and not like the scribes. That means all of these Jews and the Pharisees and these scribes, the teachers of the law, they were just teaching. I can picture it. Maybe they went, they took up their scrolls and they said, okay, this is what Moses did. This is what Isaiah has prophesied. And this is what, you know, they just, they're just teaching the people. They're just reading out and teaching. But there was a difference in the way Jesus spoke. He spoke in authority. That means he knew what he's teaching. He knew the, the, the value of the word of God that he was teaching. And he spoke like one with authority. You know, when we speak in authority, there's a difference, right? Authority, when we speak, when we teach and preach in authority, we are taking dominion, we are taking control, right, over the enemy. It's like you're saying, hey, what I'm teaching is God's word, and it has God's word is more powerful than the work of the enemy. It says here, when Jesus had finished saying these things, what was he speaking about? He was speaking about the wise and the foolish builders. He was, you know, imagine this. He's the Pharisees and all these Jews are there and Gentiles also are there. And he's saying, see, if you want to build something, right, the wise man built his house upon the rock. But the foolish man built it on sand, right? Now, the foolish man thought, okay, if I build it on sand, it'll be easy for me. But he didn't realize that when the, when the rains come and uh, comes down, that what he built was had no foundation and it's going to just be swept away. But the wise man built it on rock. So even though there were winds and rains, nothing happened to it. Now, was it some great intellectual thing? Nothing. It was, Jesus used something that was common at that time. right? But he used it and he spoke with authority. After he finished saying these things, he said, they were amazed. This man is teaching something that we already know, but he's teaching with authority. And he's teaching it in a way that we are able to understand it also. Let's look at a few more examples. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 24. Matthew 5 and 24. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled. To your brother and then come and offer your gift now think of this jesus is telling you know if you want to pray and if you want to offer your gifts first go 
reconcile with the people when when you say brother it could be anyone right not necessarily brother go reconcile with the people that you have maybe unforgiveness with make things right then come back and offer your gifts and god will be pleased with that gift look at that authority he's speaking with right then let's look at uh, matthew chapter 15 and verse 14 Let them alone, they are blind leaders of the blind. Mm. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Mm. Right now, here Jesus has just fed 5,000 people, right? And now he's talking about the clean and unclean, and, and the Pharisees come up to him and start beginning to question him. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, uh, 15 verse 10. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes them unclean, right? Uh, and then the disciples came to him. Do you, know, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Jesus is saying something. He's saying, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth that makes you unclean. Is that right or wrong? Is that right or wrong? It's right. The, the disciples come and say, hey, the, uh, Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, no, they felt bad. They were offended what you said. Jesus said, leave them alone. They are blind people leading the blind. Jesus didn't say, oh, they felt bad. I said, okay, next time tell them to come and uh, I will change my message. I'll say something nice. He didn't say, leave them alone. They are blind leading the blind. Authority, right? He, there was no ounce of fear in him. Let's read uh, Luke 10. Luke chapter 10. Uh, I hope I got it right. Okay, we don't have to read the entire verse. But in Luke 10, Jesus sends out his 72. And he says, go and do what I have told you to do. Right? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and he sends them out. And then later on in that same chapter, he's teaching about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, think of this. Parable of the Good Samaritan. He's teaching. Now, Jews and Samaritans hate each other. And you're using this story, you're teaching the Jews, telling them the Samaritan is good, better than the, uh, the leaders of the church. Who you know who saw that man who was beaten and fall on the road, but they just walked past, and the Samaritan was willing to help. Spoken authority. There are a couple of other places which are really good. Uh, maybe I'll mark them the next time. Uh, was where there's another place where he says, you know, Jesus comes and tells, uh, you know, the the leaders are looking for you, or forget where it is, but. Okay, anyways, I forget where it is, but Jesus says, go and tell that fox that I will, you know, they said, was it uh, Herod or, yeah, but he says, you know, the go and tell that fox, I will preach today, tomorrow, and I will fulfill whatever I have to do. So basically the point is, when Jesus taught, he taught with authority. He didn't teach people to let them feel good. He called a spade a spade. That means if it's a sin, it's a sin. You know, you know what's interesting? Jesus spoke, Jesus thought more about sin, Satan, and the devil and hell than anyone else. Now, why would you do that? If you're if you want a following, you will teach all good things. Jesus didn't want a following. Remember, he went up. Uh, this is really interesting. He went, he took uh, Peter, James, and John. He goes up the mountain. He finishes, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they witness one of the most brilliant things that they have seen, the transfiguration of Jesus. They come down the mountain. Uh, many of them are divided there. Then some of them say, uh, you know, for what he says, he says, I am the bread of life and all of that. And then some of them just go their own way. They said, no, we cannot take this. Because he says, Eat my body and drink my blood. Now the people are saying, wow, wow, this is too much. This is too hard a teaching. We cannot follow it. They go. Now Jesus doesn't say, oh, all my followers are going. What should I do? 
who will listen to me preach no he turns he looks at his disciples and says you also want to go you go this is my message this is what i'm going to preach and this is what i'm going to teach meaning jesus is teaching was in great authority to the fact that even when he spoke imagine he he spoke to the waters the rivers the storms and he said peace be still he didn't speak to the storms and say okay uh see don't come today can you come another day now i need to go to the other side no peace be still authority why do you think they wanted him crucified there was no ounce of fear in him pilate is standing there and he's saying are you the messiah no response tell me are you the messiah you are telling that so if you, what you're saying is right but the all people only sent me they are not my people if they were my people they wouldn't have sent me here there was no ounce of fear in him and what an example this is even as we teach we are to teach an authority wherever we are right now there are times we will go into hostile audiences like colleges or college campuses schools now we will we must learn to balance teaching you know we should be humble we should know how to put uh, put out express what we have to say but we must also speak with authority right authority doesn't mean being brash and being rude that's not what it is you can say something very simple and say it in authority right example see the coin should we give taxes jesus was not brash he is not rude when he responded to that what did he say he said see take a coin whose face you see caesar's give to caesar what belongs to caesar that means give your taxes you're living here you have to give taxes give it but you give to god what belongs to god and he is not rude he he may have said it with a in a very polite way but he said it with authority you get the difference right authority doesn't mean screaming and shouting it can also mean being quiet and simple and so you talk when you talk about leadership authority is not always speaking all the time it's also about learning to keep quiet right so jesus taught in this with authority secondly a very important feature in christ teaching method was his love for people right the 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 way he ministered he taught people because he loved them right he he didn't teach because oh man the father sent me now i have to go to jerusalem judea samaria teach these people these people don't know anything what they're doing uh, and out of all the people uh, i've chosen fishermen and tax collectors they don't know half of the things that i'm preaching and teaching no right he loved his people he loved those 12 disciples right many times the disciples came to him and said you said this parable no explain it to us we didn't understand he explained it to them but right? he loved doing what he did and right? he loved the people he looked at those 5000 people and he and he was filled with compassion and he said they were there the whole day they were listening to me preach but they need something to eat let's give them something to eat right love is the genuine foundation of his teaching ministry now this is very important for us now, we talked about even in evangelism or any other ministry we are doing love must be the foundation all right said brilliantly no he says see you can have all these things that you're doing but if you don't have love it's of no use walk in love if i am preaching to a congregation i must love that congregation then i'll be able to communicate and teach in a better manner if i'm teaching or preaching to ministering to a friend i must love that person i must want him to become a believer or i must want him to know more about jesus i must love him for who he is or who she is and i minister to that person out of love 
Jesus did that. Let's read this. Matthew chapter 23, 27 to 29. Now, interestingly, in the whole of chapter 23, Jesus is nicely giving it to the Pharisees and Sadducees. You blind guides, you are hypocrites, you are this, that. You are th and then he goes on. Let's read uh, Matthew chapter 23, 27 and 29. Yes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead man's bones mm. and all unclean uncleanness even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men but inside you are fully yeah. of hypocrisy and lawlessness woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the mount, uh, monuments of the righteous. Yeah. Now, this entire chapter, he's going on and on. Jesus is going on, you know, rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the point is, he's doing this because he's doing it out of love. He's correcting in love. He's speaking in love. He's saying, you, you, on the outside, you're showing yourself something, but in the inside, you're something else. And so Jesus is saying, on the inside, you've got to love the people. You Pharisees and Sadducees, you scribes, you leaders of the church, of the temple, you don't love the people. You don't love those who come into, into the temple to pray and do their sacrifice. You don't love them. You're just looking at it as a, as a ritual, as a responsibility that I must fulfill. Now, why is he saying this? Because he's saying... If you are uh, in this place of leadership, you must love them. You must genuinely care for them. But you don't do that because he's saying here, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate it with graves of the righteous. It's of no use. But you don't love the work of the prophets. You don't love the people that you're ministering to. How can you do all of this? right? If you read uh, Luke chapter 15, it's a brilliant and powerful example of God's love. Luke 15, the parable of the lost son, Jesus is teaching, right? And he's teaching about the love of the father, forgiveness of the father. The son goes, takes all his money, squanders all the money on prostitutes, ended up at the pig's den. Now he's thinking, I need to go back home. At least I'll get a job as a servant in my, master, in my father's house. He comes back. The father comes and hugs him and says, my son was lost, but now he's found. Think of this. Imagine you're there and Jesus is talking. I, uh, you know, if you think of it, for me, I would have thought, okay, the father is going to come and give him one and say, go. I told you, you no, know, don't take my money. Or I told you, you no, know, you have to, you know, uh, now you have to work all the money that you have spent. That, that's equal to 15 years of work. So you have to work for me for free for 15 years. Then your whatever you have taken and you've squandered all your money, then it becomes, you know, you've paid the price. No. You see the love of the father. He says, my son was dead, but now he's alive. And I can just picture the people there, their hearts are burning, just listening to this story. Everywhere Jesus went, he loved his people and he taught about love. Thirdly, his ministry was characterized by wisdom. One of, the, one of the greatest examples of Jesus' ministry is wisdom. Right? He spoke in wisdom. He walked in wisdom. Interestingly, the book of Luke, you know, in, uh, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom. It was not just given to him. It was not like, okay, I, Jesus was born and that's it. He was full of wisdom. No, he grew in wisdom and stature, right? Uh, as, a, as a little boy, he grew. See, uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Right? So Jesus grew in wisdom. It was not some switch that he put on and, uh, okay, now I'm 30 years old, I put on the switch and full wisdom came. No, he grew in wisdom. Right? 
his ministry was characterized in wisdom. I use the example of the coin, right? Whose face you see. Okay. Go and give what belongs to Caesar. Then don't, don't withhold what you have to do. In many places, they tried to trap Jesus. What did they come to Jesus and say? Why did you heal the man who uh, the the lame man on the Sabbath day? What an example Jesus gave. If uh, one of your sheep falls into the water, into the well, oh, it falls into the well, will you wait till the next day to save him? You'll go and save him, right? This person who was bound by the devil is is in sickness and in bondage. I've I've healed him on the Sabbath day. So what? They had no answer for that. Right? And look at the wisdom Jesus spoke with. He says, Before Abraham was, I am. You destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. See the wisdom. At that moment, the disciples didn't believe. It says later on that after he after he died and rose again from the dead, the disciples understood, oh, this was what he was meaning. On the third day, he will raise up the temple. Now we read it, we understand that the disciples, till he died, rose again, then only they understood it. But he spoke in such wisdom. Remember, the look at his parables, the parable of the sower. Some of them, some of the seeds fell on bushes. Some of them fell on uh, yeah. thorns, and some of them fell on rocky ground. Some of them, and he's just he's just preaching. He's teaching them. He's using simple things. What is around him, right? and he's saying, "Okay, don't look at the speck of wood in someone else's eye when you have a log of wood in your own eye." Now they are thinking, what is this? What kind of teaching is this? Wisdom. And he's saying, you are the light of the world. You don't take a light and put it under the table. You put it up. Simple logic, that is. Such wisdom he spoke. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, it's of no use. You take, if, it's, if there's salt with, with no saltiness, you take one full handful of salt and put it in the rice, nothing will happen. Still, the salt will be saltless. The rice will be saltless. Why? There's no saltiness. You can take a full, you know, like a ball of salt, which is without salt, and you can eat it. It's like sand. Nothing will happen. Try doing it when it's real salt. You can't. Now, all of this, Jesus is using what is in and around. And he's speaking with wisdom. His ministry, his, his, you know, even the disciples came and said, Where did he get all this wisdom from? Isn't he the carpenter's son? As a carpenter's son, you know, he should know how to cut wood and do all these things. But where did he get this wisdom from? I think that's in the book of Mark. I forget where in the book of Mark. Uh, so much. Uh, okay, I, I don't know the verse, but uh, yeah, many many places. Uh, in Matthew chapter, Mark chapter six, also he says, "Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this?" Yeah, sorry, M Mark chapter six and verse two. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many he who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? He, that he does even miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Have you ever thought of that? They're saying, isn't where does this man get all his wisdom from? Because this guy is a carpenter's son. We've seen him growing up. We've seen him carrying wood with his father. And we've seen his mother, we've seen his brothers, we've seen his sisters. They took offense to him. They didn't want to agree that he's speaking better, teaching better than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But his ministry was marked with wisdom. Everywhere, everywhere we see that he spoke in wisdom. The parable of the ten virgins. Readiness. And we talk about more about parables as well. Right? So... He characterized his teaching with wisdom.
an important lesson for us. Even when we, as you know, we get these opportunities to teach and to preach or minister, make sure you be wise. Example, if you are teaching in, in a place, right? Be wise to use the right examples. Be wise to choose the right topic. Right? And these all these things matter, right? Now, if you go to a village and you're teaching, don't teach about AI, artificial intelligence. You don't give an example about AI, please. They will be sitting and saying, nodding their head for everything. So if you're in, in, a, in a village setting or a town setting, give examples that are around them. So one of the things I always do is when I go to these villages and towns, first thing I do is parable of the sower. They know it. You put a seed. Water it, look after it, it'll grow. You use the parable of the sower, they would have got it like that. I am the vine, you are the branches. Use those examples. They will get it. They're all people from there. Now you talk about AI to them, they want to know what is AI. Right? So again, wisdom, right? Now when you're you're in a you're in a setting where there is youth, and this is 2024. Youth, millennials, Gen Z, right? Now, don't talk about all boring stuff. You to be wise. You need to know, okay, what can I talk that I can grasp their attention? Don't go to, you know, what William Carey did when he came. Now, there's a time for that, right? Don't give them dates and years and this is what, no. You got to, you got 45 minutes or 50 minutes, you got to give what is needed, what something that they can. You know, really take. So you ask God for wisdom there. Fourthly, first one was teaching with authority. Second was love. Third is wisdom. Fourth, he combined it with the supernatural ministry. And this is where it is, we see so much. Jesus is teaching. He takes the five loaves. He says, everyone are hungry. What do we have? Five loaves of bread and two fish. He takes it, prays, he breaks it, and he says, give it to everyone. Supernaturally, food was multiplied, feeding 5,000 people apart from women and children. Think of it. Five loaves of bread and two fish. This want to and feed our Bible college. We'll be fighting for, I want some more bread. <laughs> You say 5,000 people supernaturally. That means what? He backed up what he thought with the supernatural. Jesus didn't say, I've come to heal you. Okay, please heal me. I'm blind. No, you, you come after the, I'm going to first die on the cross. After I die on the cross, you come. And they'll say, no, thank you. I might as well be like this. When the lepers came to him, right? He was going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. He met the leper. So the leper says, if you are willing, you can cleanse me. Jesus says, I'm willing. Leprosy, there is no, there is no medicines even now to cure leprosy. Forget about those days, Jesus' days. He says, I'm willing. This leprosy was gone. The woman with the issue of bleeding, he has thought and he's walking. Somebody comes and touches. Jesus says, you know, I am I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now Lazarus is dead. You said, no, you're the way, truth, and life. Do something. She says, okay, I'll do something. I'm the resurrection and the life. Move the tomb. And he said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. So he didn't just... Have you seen people who have big words and, and say, do nothing? I've seen many people like that. Only words. But they don't do anything about it. I have many friends that I know. I want to do this, 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 this. Start. When When will you start? I'll start. When? I'll start. Don't worry. I'll start. <laughs> I think only words. Two years is over. Five years is over. I'll start. When I'm 40, I will start. Who told you you'll see 40 years old? What if your life is wanted tomorrow? So 
don't be a person full of only words. Jesus said, I, I will back up what I said. You know, Jesus himself says, right? He says to the, the, the people there, he says, if you don't believe who I am, at least look at the miracles that I've done. Nobody's done such miracles. I'm testifying who I am with the miracles I'm doing. Right? Has anyone raised anyone from the dead? No, I did it. Has anyone walked on water? No. Has anyone uh, cleansed the le leper? No. Has anyone, uh, you know, uh, uh, opened blind eyes? No. Paralytic all their life for more than 38 years there in that same place and hasn't even moved. I made him get up and run home. Now, you're not believing that I'm the Messiah, but look at the miracles that I have done. Jesus not only taught, but he also combined it with the supernatural ministry. Things, what is supernatural? Things that cannot be understood in the mind. Have you ever thought of this? Walking on water? Now, this is not a, that was not a normal one small lake that he walked on. It was a sea, and he's walking in the middle of a storm. There are winds coming. And Jesus is not wobbling around trying to, you know, oh, no, wind speed. No, he just walked with authority. The supernatural. Right? Jesus says, I've given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. Where's the authority? He showed us that he had authority. Imagine Legion. The people have tied up this man who's demon possessed with chains. And legs, and they've chained him up. He scratches his body. Even though he's chained, he's breaking the chain, running everywhere. People were afraid to pass by that way. Now, I have seen people who are, you know, possessed. And it's some of them are very, very, very scary. Right? You cannot do it in your own physical, in your own natural way. You will not, you will crumble. You will run away from them. It was it was so scary for me. Right? But Jesus is here. You see this man. He's nailed and I'm sorry. He's chained up and he's scratching himself. And people were afraid to even pass by. Jesus goes there. They come running and fall at his feet, saying, "Oh, why have you come so early? Don't send us to the pit of destruction. At least send us to the pigs. We'll go there." Supernatural. Again, that authority that he walked in. So, you and I need the faith. right? Jesus didn't say, I'm the Messiah. He chose his 12 disciples and he didn't say, I'm the Messiah. They said, okay. Then he said, okay, remember, I'm the Messiah. They said, okay. No. He kept saying, yes, I am the one. I am the son of man. The first thing he did is after choosing his 12 disciples, he says, come, I'll show you one miracle. Let's go for a party. They go to Cana. Wine is over. I know. What to do? We'll change the water into wine. Simple. He said, I'm the Messiah. He backed it up with the works. Because it says there, in the Bible, it says that the disciples saw that miracle and they put their faith in him and believed. So you and I can combine our teaching with the supernatural ministry. Right. Ask God for miracles. Expect God, while you're ministering the word, for miracles to happen. Fifth, Jesus spoke in figurative language, which is one of the most important characteristics of Jesus' teachings. Now, there are two things here. Jesus used metaphors. The word metaphor is, is like a figure of speech. Let's look at an example. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 11. Matthew 16, 11. Matthew six, Matthew sixteen eleven. How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Be be word of the live living of the Pharisees seduce. <clears throat> yeah. Verse eleven, right? Yeah. Yes. So it says, how is it? You don't understand that what I was talking to you about, I was not talking 
to you about bread. But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Again, he's, he's talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, it's a figure of speech. The Pharisees and Sadducees were not yeast. They were men, human beings. But he's using it as a, as a figure of speech. Right? They are, they are like yeast. The Pharisees were not really blind. But he says they are like blind people leading the blind. You get what I'm saying? You are the salt of the earth. Now, the, we are not salt. You are like the salt. Figure of speech. right? So he used a lot of figurative language. Secondly, he used hyperboles. Hyperboles means exaggerations. Example. It's easier for a camel to go into the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the enter heaven. Now, this is a hyperbole, exaggeration. Can a camel enter the eye of a needle? Impossible. It's an exaggeration. So he used many of these. Um, it's called a hyperbole. And then he used parables. And we have many parables. Um, parable of the lost son, parable of the lost sheep, kingdom parables, right? a parable of the sower. Many, many, many parables. Parables are what? Uh, the Greek word here, parabole, uh, means to cast alongside. It's a uh, extended story. Now, everyone likes stories, right? Especially when it comes to uh, preaching and teaching. The moment you say, let me tell you a story, everyone's attention is, yeah, they, they cast that. So Jesus had that way of getting people's attention. He used parables. It's a earthly story with a heavenly meaning or a heavenly purpose, yes, right? It's an earthly story. Parable of the lost son, earthly story. Parable of the lost coin. Somebody lost the coin. This woman didn't let go. She, oh, she tried everything. Finally, when she found that coin, she was so happy. She went and told everyone, I found the coin. Now, it was an earthly story, but it had a heavenly meaning. One person comes to Christ. Right? The, the entire heaven is rejoicing with that. Right? So, three ways that Jesus spoke. One is, figures, one is metaphors, that is figures of speech. Two is hyperboles, like exaggeration. And three is parables. And Christ used parables for two reasons. See here in your notes. To illustrate truths and to obscure truth from those whose heads were unyielding. So he used parables to illustrate truth. He wanted people to understand. Example, parable of the sower. If your heart is like thorns or like, uh, like rock, the seed of God's word is not going to bear fruit in your life. That's just what he's saying, right? But if your heart is like good ground, then the word of God, which is like a seed, will be planted in your heart and it will bear fruit in your life. Simple yet powerful. Illustrate truth. Now they were able to understand this because I'm sure farming would have been there. And they know, the farmers know, that you can't put seed on rocks. It's not going to grow. Or on thorny places. It's not a good place. But if it's good ground, it will grow well. So in the same way, I should clean my heart. I should make sure I have a good, clean heart so that the seed of God's word planted in my heart will bear fruit. Makes sense? Makes sense. Right? So he set these examples, parables, to illustrate the truth of God's word. And sometimes he also, uh, he also ministered these parables to obscure the truth from those whose heads were hard and yielding. So, for example, there are certain parables that Jesus spoke of, but, uh, you know, it was to, they did not understand it. Not only parables, like, for example, he says, right, uh, he's teaching, he's saying, I am the bread of life. I am what came down from heaven. If, as long as you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not partake the kingdom of God. This was too much of a teaching. They did not agree to it. They did not like it. They did not want to follow it. Many of them left. 
but he didn't change the message because people left he continued with it right so uh let's look quickly at three examples of the parables told uh, by christ the lost sheep something about lostness christ is illustrating god's attitude uh, uh, towards sinners when they come to him they are found right there are many sinners but when they come to jesus when they come to him their lives are find meaning and they are found so he gives three parables there the lost sheep the lost coin and the lost son what a beautiful example right lost sheep 100 are there 99 are safe one goes away the shepherd is willing to leave the 99 in a safe place go and find that one that's the heart of the father even if one person goes away he's willing to go and find him right all these three parables talking about lostness and how when we discover christ christ just uh, you know takes us back and uh, receives us and uh, his love for the sinners then we have many other themes here uh, on what jesus taught us on uh, some of the themes that parables that jesus taught on forgiveness generosity humility then he, uh, he talked about judgment the kingdom the law the lord's return mercy and prayer so what we'll do is we'll stop here next class we we'll look at a few verses from each of these and then we'll uh, you know bring this uh, chapter to a close we'll try to move into the teacher in the early church right but we will continue from here we'll look at a few verses from each theme from this parables that jesus taught right okay let's close with a word of prayer anyone would like to pray go ahead go ahead pray pray thank you heavenly father this come to your net father this is past teaching of the other ministry foundation father the whatever other ministry doing father that's your the guide in your the teaching or oh, thank you lord this time we are the going to other doing father in jesus name pray amen 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 all right thank you everyone i'll see you next week god bless